Blessed are the dead. But where? Let me say that again. Blessed are the dead. I'll add this to it. Where are they blessed? And that's what we want to think about today for a little while. When you think about what the Bible teaches about death, it means separation from God. I don't think any of us, no matter how much Bible we know and how much like Christ we're living, can understand what it means to be separated from God. Now, in this probationary state where we have time in the flesh to prove to God we love Him, we take Him at His word, and we act by faith, then we're not seeing and experiencing what is involved in being totally and absolutely and forever cut off from anything that has to do with God from whom all blessings flow. Because in this life, we're still benefiting from the favor of God. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. And that is a, simply a principle that says God's blessing on everybody nowadays in this physical realm for the purpose he made it. But when you go and look at what the Bible says about the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, the second death, you're looking at that place prepared for the devil and his angels where God is totally absent from the whole thing. There's nothing pertaining to God when it comes to hell. Nothing. In effect, it's like if I don't want to serve him here, if I don't want to take him in his word here, if I don't want to take advantage of why he's given me life in the flesh, if I go to do my own thing here, if I'm living on the level of the flesh here, and I live my whole life that way, then God says, here's where you want to go then. You don't want me, I've made a place for you. Where I'm not involved in, with you in any form or fashion forever. That's what makes hell, hell. But on the other hand, we want to be concerned about why God would say and give us encouragement in why he would say, blessed are the dead. Who is blessed? Death reigned all those years as God prepared and worked things out to make it possible so that man would not be totally held of death because sin could not be taken care of. Sin was the problem. You've heard me say it often, but it needs to be emphasized. You may not like somebody's hairdo. You may not like the shoes they have or the car they drive. You may not even like the sound when they laugh. You may not like any of those things. They may grate on your nerves. But if none of it constitutes sin, which is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, none of that comes between them and God. None of that can separate them from God. Thus, we need to know the sin problem since it's the only thing that can separate us from God. And if we die guilty of sin, we go to where there's no connection of God at all to that place. So we find that Paul wrote to Timothy saying that Christ hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 2 Timothy 1.10 again. You know, through is a preposition. And he's saying plainly here that he hath brought life and immortality to light. But what is the channel whereby it's brought to us? It's through the gospel, which Paul says is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1 16. The glad tidings of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 
And it was because of this great expectation that Christ brought that the aged uh, apostle John said, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. This is that eternal expectation of all those who are faithful in their service to God as Christians in the Lord's church. You may have expectations of getting some sort of educational uh, ideas done, some sort of degrees, some sort of certificates. You may have the idea of paying a house off or paying the car off or someday retiring and all that. But all of those expectations pale into absolute insignificance when you consider that Paul said that we're saved by hope. That great expectation of the faithful children of God to be in possession of heaven, to be in heaven, to be glorified as Christ is now glorified. And there is that earnest, strong, feverish desire to possess the promise that Christ has made to us. Thus Paul could say he has a desire to be with Christ which is far better. If heaven is not far, far, far and as many other far as you want to put on there better than here then I've missed the whole idea of what the Bible is trying to say to me about my long home Jesus Christ endured the cross. Scripture says, despising the shame, Hebrews 12, 2. And what was the purpose of that? Ultimately and finally, he went through all that ordeal that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. And that means that until Christ accomplished what only he could do in living a sinless life, though tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, accomplishing the suffering that he had to do and the death on the cross and the resurrection, until he actually did that, then in actuality, there was no victory over death. You say, well, what about all those worthies under the patriarchy or under the law of Moses, the Jews? They were forgiven in view of the fact that Christ would do what the Bible said he would do. In Hebrew, there is a prophetic perfect in the grammar. It speaks of things that God is going to do as if they are already done. And that shows you that when God makes a promise to do something, He does it. And you can speak of it as having already been accomplished. Until Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then the question of all the ages was what you run across in Job 14 and verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? And that causes you to realize he's not just talking about the inward man, the spirit fathered by God that goes into a Hadean world, place of disembodied spirits returning to God who gave it. But he has in mind the spirit in the body. I don't understand all this, but I know God intended the human spirit to be in the human body. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5. That is, the body that we presently possess like a tent. The Greek word for tabernacle there is skene. It's a temporary dwelling place. 
But he says we have a building, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's looking beyond the disembodied state to the, state, to the resurrection in a glorified body. Now, I don't know why God did that. It's obvious angels don't have bodies, spiritual or otherwise. They have a form. And you don't, lose, you don't use your, lose your person in your form when you leave this body. Obviously, Abraham was Abraham when he left this body. And Lazarus was Lazarus when he left this body. That was in a place of comfort. Jesus was Jesus when he was in paradise, as was the thief. But they're not having anything to do with things of material time and space. So it's obvious the center and core of our being is the spirit, yet God intended to dwell in the body. I don't understand why. I just know it's so. And I know John talks about we don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him. And that tells me my Lord obtained a glorified body. Jesus is the picture at this present time ruling at the right hand of God of glorified humanity. I don't think we think about that enough. When our Lord gave up the form of deity, took upon himself the form of humanity, John would say flesh, he took upon himself what we are. Didn't cease to be God. He simply took on himself what we are. You might call it a, a merging or a marrying of the two. He's the only being like himself. Truly son of man, truly son of God. Nobody else like that. And here's the thing that shows me his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We think of that as him coming to earth, tempting every point like as we are. His sorrows, his suffering, all of that. And dying on the cross. And that's true. But once he took upon himself humanity, he did not divest himself of it. And that's even more amazing. As Paul would say to Timothy, there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. Well, that's said years after he returned to heaven and sat at the right hand of God where he is right now. And when John says, we don't know what we'll be like, but we will be like him. What's he talking about? You don't become deity. So how are we going to be like him? We have a resurrected body. We will be glorified humans. That's the reason Christ is spoken of as the first fruits of them that slept. People have been raised from the dead before by the miracles of God. But they had to die again. When Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, died, he had to die again. But when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, that was to die no more. First fruits of them that slept, meaning first fruits of them that died, to where he dies no more. And he's raised, and he's raised up to go to heaven, and he even prayed in his prayer, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Yet that would be in a glorified body. And he, in saving us and going through the process, forever took upon himself, a glorified body. Christ didn't have that body before he took it on in flesh. But once having it, he keeps it forever and elevates those faithful to him to be in the same plane in the sense of a glorified body. I don't think we think about that enough. That's the reason I say sometimes I don't know what God has in store for us in the next life, but it involves something. You know we're not going to sit there and stare at one another. There's work to do. I have no, it may not be called work there. I don't, I don't know what it'll be. There'll be activity. There's something planned. In the mind of the Almighty, there's something planned for those who reach heaven. And they're getting prepared to do that work by going through what we're going through right now. The answer to Job's question, if a man dies, shall he live again, is found by Jesus in his earthly ministry, as John records in John chapter 11 and verse 25, where he says, at the time that he raised Lazarus from the dead, or he was about to, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, 
yet shall he live. Well, there again, that shows you that since we don't see his consciousness or our personality doesn't cease when we die, he has to have in mind the resurrection because that's what he's about to do. He's about to, by the power of his word, say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Someday he will sound out for all of us and everybody will come forth. The picture of the tomb was certainly brightened when Jesus placed that bouquet of immortality upon it. Blessed are the dead. Where now? In the Lord. People read that and I don't think they know what they're reading. They understand blessed. They can look that up. They understand Lord. They can understand dead. But they don't get the connection. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. And of course, some people have looked at that and said, well, a person goes totally unconscious when he dies, doesn't know anything. He's speaking of the repose of the body. Even funeral directors and so forth now, those preparing a body for burial, they have them looking like they're at rest. They look like they're asleep. But it's not speaking of the spirit. That's obvious from Luke 16. They're still just as alive and animated as they can be. They're just not in time, space, and material things here on earth. Then, of course, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. But he said that after saying this, and this is something I must do. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you remember what we've said many times about the word let, L-E-T? That has the force of a command. I have the responsibility and obligation to God concerning myself that I not allow myself to be troubled as people who have no hope, as people who are non-Christians, who people who don't know a thing about God. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return again and receive you unto myself, that there where I am ye may be. Also, John 14, 1 through 3. Again, we concentrate much on death when we probably ought to be concentrating more on life. Death is a doorway to the faithful child of God. That's all it is. What I've always been concerned about is how long it takes to get the door open for me to go through, and that's called dying, the process of dying. And yet again, I'm quite sure that we give more thought to that than we ought to because we have a way of, it just comes down to this, worrying. And yet we're taught not to do that either. We just make it worse when we do, and there's anything we can do about it. To live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what Paul said. I mentioned that a while ago. That comes from Philippians 1, beginning verse 21 and then skipping over verse 23. I'll, I'll point that out. For to me to live is Christ, die is gain. The Lord said that. Then he said, for I am a straight betwixt the two. Look at that word straight. At least in the King James Version, S-T-R-A-I-T. Not S T R A. I G H T. In our modern usage, straight covers both S T R A I T and S T R A I G H T. But it, straight nowadays, most of the time, gets used as a straight line right up this aisle. But S T R A I T means a hard, rigorous, burden down thing. And Paul says, I wrestle with this. This is a straight thing. Why? He was an apostle of Christ. He loved the brethren on earth. As long as he was here, he could help them. He could 
fight false teachers. He could fight the fight of faith. He could teach the brethren. He could spread the gospel. But when that ceases, all that works over with. And yet he knew that the reward, even in the Hadean world, was far better. Far better. Now, the old world shouldn't hold and didn't to the faithful child of God such fascination. And so you see Paul, it didn't hold such fascination for him. Here's what he said to the Corinthians. We are confident, I say, and willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8. Paul's hope was set on a higher ground, much higher ground. He says, for our conversation is in heaven. The word conversation in King James means our manner of life, our conduct, everything about us is in heaven. From whence we look for the Savior. The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 3.20. And therefore, in trusting faith, the Apostle Paul could say, I am now ready to be offered. Maybe we would do well since we don't tend to suffer absolute martyrdom as Stephen and Paul did and many others of that day and time to realize that as long as we're in the church, whether it's 10 years or 60, however long we might be Christians on earth, we're in the process of sacrificing ourselves. None of the Old Testament, dead animals, according to the law, were sacrificed. They had to give up those animals. They were to be the best animals in their flock to offer to God. But they sacrificed them. They meant something to them. They were important to them, but they gave them up. They sacrificed them to God. But we learn from Romans 12. They were to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy unto God, which is our acceptable, reasonable service. So while we may think of dying for the cause of Christ like Stephen, and yes, that was a sacrifice, really our whole life is offered upon the altar of God as a sacrifice to Him. So even this day, we are sacrificed to God by the way we live. The Christian life is one of labor. It's one of Rigorous toil at times and great concern. And rest is waiting. It's out there ahead. Jesus said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But notice, this happens first. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest in your souls. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. So the saints of God, those who've heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel added to the church by the Lord himself, they are sanctified, set apart, suitable for the master's service. They trust in something far, far better than what this earth has to offer. In Job 3.17, it was put this way. Where we find rest because we're faithful after this life, Job said, of that place... There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. But remember, this promised rest is not for everyone, and sadly, I'm afraid it's not for the majority. And to whom swear he that he should not enter into his rest? but to them that believe not. So we that they could not enter, so we see that they could not enter, could not enter in because of unbelief. Israel of old, fleshly Israel, most of them that left Egypt, 20 years old and upward, all of them but Joshua and Caleb, all died because of sin in the wilderness. And they were not, though they passed through the cloud of the sea, baptized the Moses of the cloud of the sea, Paul said. 
They died in the wilderness. Why did they die in the wilderness? Their greatest enemy. Sin was in their lives. And he says we ought to look at that. We ought to take note of it. We ought to think about ourselves because here's how he says it. Lest, uh, let us therefore fear. See, fear is a proper part of Christian living and of loving God. The kind of fear he talks of is a companion to love. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Hebrews 3, 18 through chapter 4 and verse 1. An example of Israel failing to find the fleshly Israel, the temporal land of rest, is used to help us. That was written by God knowing. All that happened with God knowing, I mean this to apply to the church. Isn't that interesting? They without us are not perfect. That is, what was happening to them, God had in mind, this would be an example for the church as to why it should be faithful and what's going to happen if they're not. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Then he said, there remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. Hebrews 4, 3 and 9. Well, the reward of this amazing, marvelous, sweet rest will fully and overly compensate for all the trials and tribulations and labors that come upon us because we love the Lord and keep His commandments on this earth. Listen to how it's written in the Hebrews epistle, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name. Think about that a little while. Let that settle in. When you do things as the New Testament prescribes, we ought to do them regarding serving Christ. When we discharge our obligations as his children and his family, and when we cease from those things he does not approve of, God knows them. He remembers every one of them. And that's one of the things that comes out even when Christ said, not a sparrow falls, you didn't know about it. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. It's not forgotten. And so we remember that Christ said that if you just give a cup of water to somebody in the name of the Lord, then he's taken note of. The point is, is to be a faithful member of the Lord's church. That's where he takes note of those things. And somebody then, of course, wrote the song, Give Just a Cup of Water. I place it in your hand. Then just a cup of water is all that I demand. Now, the truth of the matter is, most of us can do a whole lot more than offering a cup of water. But that's trying to say, when you do it to obey me because you love me and you love your neighbor as yourself and you're benevolent, you want to help people who can't help themselves, I know that. And it goes down as your reward. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, Paul wrote to the brethren, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. You, you may be forgotten by your kids or by your parents or by a sibling. You may be rejected or whatever. And it may be directly because you obey God and you will not be moved off of His authority. But there's not one deed or work that will go unrewarded in the judgment. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You ought to know what it is already. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Vain means pointless, worthless, empty. But it's not in vain. When you give a cheering word to somebody who may be down, and you do it because you're concerned, it ranges all the way from that to having to stand in a pulpit and fight error or to confront somebody's face as Paul did Peter. All of that 
or whether it's just being with the brethren and encouraging them, God knows. And we sing the song, Jesus Knows, Jesus Cares. We learn then from the scriptures, too, that their works do follow them. So the theme of eternal reward, according to our deeds, our conduct, our doings, our works, runs the whole course of the scriptures. And it was the inspired apostle Paul who spelled it out so clearly. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now that's not trying to meritoriously work your way to heaven. It's simply saying that as a Christian, like James talked about, there are things God expects Christians to do that's obligatory, that's characteristic of anybody that loves God and is faithful to Him. And that's what's being talked about. And God will reward you accordingly. And it says simply on this way, for we are laborers together with God. I don't know if we let that thing get enough, for we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 9. We have our part to play in this whole thing. God has His. And together, we get the job done. Paul pictured the day of judgment for this purpose. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Here's why. That we may receive the things done in the body. When am I going to receive the reward of a faithful Christian done in this body? When we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Do you realize all the people that's ever opposed you because you were serving God? All the people that ever accused you of things you didn't do? All those people who were liars and whatever they are that are wicked, the Lord's people will be vindicated on that day. When people deny the existence of God, one of the things they deny by implication is that there is a day of complete and perfect justice for all men. They deny that. Because in this world, no matter how well we deal with things and desire justice, we're imperfect human beings. We can make mistakes. The only mistakes made on that day. He says that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now for the faithful, the sheep, on the right hand, that's the good. I'm thinking about writing an article that just simply says, are you good? And it came from, I mentioned this morning, asking that young man the other day when I said, have you been good? Now think about that for a minute. What is it to be good? Was your lunch good? Have you been good? Are your children good? Is your husband or wife good? Go to which one of them you ask about the other at whatever time it might be. <laughs> think of how we use the word good. Barnabas is said to be a good man. Scripture says of Jesus, he went about doing good. What does that mean? Good. Well, I can tell you one thing I know it means. You're faithful to God in all things. Because Abraham was the father of the faithful, and that meant he did what God told him to do in the way he told him to do it for the reason. And he's called the father of the faithful, and he's also said he was a friend of God. He was a friend of God because he was faithful, thus he did good. When he took his only son as a trial of his own faith and was going to offer him a, a, a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice after he killed him, that was good. Now, people don't think that way. But it was good. We need to ask the question, what does it mean to be good? What a privilege of being able to be a Christian. You know, the Bible says that we're to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And then he tells us why. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
Now you know why so many people's heart or their life is not what it ought to be. Their heart's not in heaven. It's on whatever their job is or whatever their hobby is or both or their family or sports or whatever it might be. But it's not on heaven. And if your heart is not there, your life will not be showing it here. Jesus spake often of the rewards laid up for those who served him. And the aged apostles saw the books opened in Revelation 20, 13. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And so what a privilege it is to be involved in serving God. Because we're sending things on ahead. But it's how we use them here. It's what we do here. And thus we're right back to one reason this scripture was put up here. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. But all of this, as the title of the lesson I hope indicated, blessed are the dead, and I said, but where? Caused us to realize that it has to be in the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now, therefore, that doesn't include everyone. A person cannot die in a state, a relationship he has not entered in life. For example, I can't die in Canada unless I enter Canada. That's his name. Is that hard to understand? I can't die in the state of Arkansas unless I enter the state of Arkansas. And I could never die in any place I haven't entered into. Can you see that this satisfies or should define and give us understanding that I cannot die in Christ without entering into Christ? Look at what Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica with that in mind. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 14 through 18. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, sleep where? In Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And by the way, that's I mentioned prevent. How it's using the King James Version. It doesn't mean what it means now. If you read it as it means now, this won't make any sense. What he's saying is, is that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not come before them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, I'm amazed sometimes people say, well, the Lord's already come. Job's witness say came 1914. I don't think you would miss it when you see it described right here. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, when, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Little prepositions sure do carry a lot of information. Even them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Then also the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then comfort one another with these words. These words are for those who are in Christ. And not for those outside of Christ. So we believe one of the most vital things to be learned is how to enter into Christ. 
And that seems to be something the world just kind of stubs its nose at and says, I see Jesus save me, and goes trotting right on off, forgets the rest of the will of Christ that they say they appreciate and love. But they pay no attention to it. The Lord did withhold that information, and he plainly said it has been quoted many times, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, there it is, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. How can you put him on in any other way other than being baptized into him? Bring to me the Bible that verse that says you get into Christ through believing only, through repenting only, believing and repenting only, believing and repenting and confessing his faith only. Any one of them standing alone or all three of them together. Tell me how those will put you into I-N-T-O Christ. They won't. Are they necessary? Are they essential? Absolutely. But they precede the step that puts you into Christ. And if you don't engage in them, belief, repentance, and confession, you don't get into Christ by that step. You can go be dunked under the water a thousand times. But if you haven't believed and repented of your sins, it's not going to do any good. So baptism is into Christ. By the authority of Christ, we're immersed into Christ. By the authority of Christ, we're baptized for the remission of sins. Yeah, but my preacher said that, and I believed always otherwise, and I'd be rebelling against my family and upsetting everybody if I changed. Don't expect, then, if you're going to hold that attitude to hear come from your Lord on the day of judgment, well done, good and faithful servant, when you know right now you're not good and faithful and you won't take him in his work. So, for, one, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And it's the spiritual body of Christ the church. That's the one he adds us to. Acts 2, 47. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Colossians 1, 18. And I would ask simply as Paul did, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death. Let me ask you this. Where do you find the scriptures that says you believe into his death? Where do you find that? Believe into his death. You can't find it. You know why you can't find it? It's not there. So, well, I just don't know about that preacher. Read it like God said you ought to, and you'll find out it's not there. Romans 6, 3. So Bible scholars have sought, <laughs> we call them scholars, in vain for just one other entrance into Christ, but it is not there. Somebody described an atheist as, let's see if I can remember how it goes. A blind man looking for a black cat in a dark room. Not going to work. It's not baptism only, it's not belief only, it's not repentance only. When you think about, I know exactly what he said, I know it's in my Bible, I can read it there now, but I'm not going to do it. Then where's the problem? It's not a problem of understanding. It's a problem of rebellion. I won't do what I know it says I ought to do. Now you might ask, well, what reason would cause anybody to do that? Well, you have to explain that to me. I don't know, but they've done it for a long, long time. And they can do it on until the end of time. And they still won't be saved. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Day henceforth they shall rest for their labors, their works do follow them. If you're not in Christ, it's because you haven't been baptized in Christ as a penitent believer. If you're in Christ, you still need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You have to be faithful. Be thou faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, and you'll receive a kind of life. So if you haven't obeyed the gospel this afternoon, then this blessing is not yours. Because you're not in the Lord. You haven't entered into the Lord. As a child of God, are you faithful? If not, if there are areas of your life need to be corrected, then repentance and confession of sin, forgiveness is offered by God for the child of God who will do that. 
So think about these wonderful promises. And think about how important they are. How quickly life's little pages are flying by. It won't be long for any of us. Some of us sooner than others. Until life's little day's over. And there shall be before us a vast eternity. The prophet said our long home. What would it be? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Or will it be, depart from me, I never knew you. Into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We hold the deciding vote. We make up our minds to which way we'll go. Let it be to where we can enjoy the blessing of being in the Lord and dying in the Lord. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, I invite you to come where we stand while we sing.